We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was a really interesting race today, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Spain. <laughs> yeah, There's a Spain, lot going on. Spain happened. Spain yes. happened. Yes. We're back Spain to, happened, but... you know, good quality racing. Yeah, and it was it, it was exciting racing, but it was also like exciting racing like at the top half of the grid, which we haven't really seen a lot lately. Usually our, our excitement is like the like 10 through 14 is really yeah. exciting, but now we had like excitement from 1 through 5. I'd say we had excitement from like 1 to 13, maybe? <laughs> You know, bottom of the that. grid wasn't too exciting, but but no, nope. I just like it was like you said. We normally have like a chunk of four or five cars with a really good fight, really good race, and it always tends to happen towards the bottom of the grid. But I feel like this race, we really had good overtaking, good racing, good strategy across majority of the grid. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a portion of it. And then there were some that was just very anonymous. I, I will say that I, I didn't make a lot of notes, especially towards like the latter half of the race, like the latter half of the race was just like happening. And it was like, it was exciting, but there wasn't a lot noteworthy from like, right. the midpoint until, you know, the, the last 10, 15 laps. Agreed. Definitely agreed. Um, yeah. That start did not anticipate oh, the start man. of that race at did all. Did not think, see that coming. I think my exact DM to you was fucking George. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or that, is, that is exactly what. Because I can never actually type out that word. But uh, no, that's exactly what it was. Um, and it was funny to hear Hamilton, too, in the cool down room be like, oh, wow, he really just snuck up around the side on you guys, didn't he? <laughs> like, yeah, he I, side. so I, I, I missed the cool down room. I didn't miss, I, I had it so open good. on my phone, but I was at, I was at our, our pre-breakfast, you know, gathering point. And I'm like, breakfast and podium, breakfast and podium. And I wanted to listen because I love the cool down room, but you know. Anyway, before we dive into to the, the race, we have a little bit of news um, to tackle. Um, speaking of Lewis Hamilton, did you know that Mercedes is sabotaging his car on purpose? No, I didn't. But I'm so glad that we now have an email that went out for us to be aware of it. <laughs> yeah, like for the love of all that is holy, people need to stop emailing the paddock for things. Though I'm sure, you know, the Red Bull family is thrilled that the emails aren't about them. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, if some, like, you know, if something truly, truly deep down, fundamentally, was going on and was wrong, I think that would be a huge issue. I don't think we need to email the entire paddock about it. Um, but I do think that's wrong. Now, if someone just has, like, you know, their tinfoil hat on, as Catherine likes to say, yeah, and it's like, oh, well, he's not doing well this season, and he's leaving this team at the end of the season so there's sabotage um i feel like you know we're hearing hoof hoofs and calling zebras a little bit yeah and it's like it, like honestly it goes back to what i've been saying basically since the 2022 season before this podcast was even a thought in our minds of lewis isn't being sabotaged a the cars that mercedes has been building have not been to anyone's expectation and b lewis hamilton has been fundamentally changed as a driver since he lost to max in 2021 completely agree i think they're coming back around a little bit like oh for sure undoubtedly i not gonna lie very surprised by the car's performance this weekend um for real <laughs> like and i hate it because we all know our thoughts and feels on this podcast about Mercedes besides Total Wolf. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think things are coming around. I just, I find it so ironic and funny that this email came out. There's sabotage. He's not doing well because of it. And he ends up on the podium. <laughs> Same weekend. Yeah, no, it, I, I don't think he's being sabotaged. I think that this is all just like. It's it's a Lewis issue, not a Mercedes issue. Um, but, you know, the police well, are involved, and we'll see what comes of it. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, though, if this email came, from, you know, if the call came from within, within the house, then I think it's definitely That's one a Mercedes thing. issue. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. 
Um, also, I do, I know we kind of, like, covered this on our social media bit, but there was a fire in the paddock. Um, oh, right, yes. At McLaren, and it was, I thought it was really nice and classy for Zach Brown. I know, I never thought I would put those two things in a sentence, but here I am. Right. To, um, in a pre-race interview, thank all the teams that came together to help McLaren out. So their kitchen was completely destroyed. They had no food for the entire weekend, and... He said that Mercedes was amazing and they fed the whole team the entire weekend and other teams were stepping in and helping, you know, for other other ways. They were offering offices to um, people who needed an office for McLaren. So I thought that was really, you know, nice of him to highlight that. He didn't have to, um, but I think it's just always nice when, you know, we see camaraderie in the paddock. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's it's great. It's really fortunate that nobody was injured. Everybody was evacuated. Even, you know, Oscar and Lando were both in the in the motorhome when it happened, I believe. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I think I, I read somewhere that someone like one of the top guys at Pirelli is like a part time firefighter. So he went on. He put his first responder hat back on and like went straight in to help. And Like he's like, I, I think like firefighter, paramedic, something. Um, but yeah, it, it's great to have these moments where like everyone's coming together. Yeah. Um, and I think it's cool, too, that, you know, the team thanked all the firefighters and the the first responders who were there and they got to meet the team and walk around the garage like in a non fire capacity. Um, so I just I just like, you know, the, the warm and fuzzy stories that, that come out of things from F1. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then on a little bit of a less warm and fuzzy side, uh, (laughs) this has kind of been talked about, you know, relatively recently, but um, in in kind of a potentially happening, but it's official. Flavio Briatore, who was once banned for life from the sport of Formula One, is now back in Formula One as an advisor for Alpine. And I'm just fascinated by this whole thing. Like, before we talk more about it, I just love how much like f1 flip-flops and they are Mm -hmm. the ultimate flip-flopper of anyone out there it's like you're banned for life no you're not you're never mind now you're and now you're back at alpine (sighs) yeah exactly he's back at alpine so for those of you don't who don't know flavio briatore is basically the crashgate mastermind and i've talked about crashgate before because felipe massa is has been was is in the process of suing formula one and the fia um because he like Crashgate is part of the reason why he lost um, the 2008 World Championship. Um, and Briatore was basically the guy who told Nelson Piquet Jr. to crash the car on purpose at the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix so Fernando Alonso could win. Um, and it, you know, screwed Massa out of some points that would have helped him get enough points to beat Lewis. But then on the other side of it, um, Massa's team also screwed up a pit stop. So they kind of hampered themselves. And it, it's it's really, you know, kind of a net zero type of situation, but it's also very unfortunate. Um, but yeah, Briatori is back. I mean, honestly, I think Alpine is just throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. That's where they're at yeah. at this point. Yeah, especially so. since he's, you know, focus, uh, focusing on these, like, top-level areas with the team and especially scouting out talent and helping them decide on, like, who they're going to go with in the driver market. Like, that's kind of a, a big deal thing, and especially since they have an opening with Ocon seat, um, he will have his hands on who the next driver at Alpine is. Yeah, I something's going on in that house. I. I don't know. It's an interesting choice. It's a choice. It is a choice. It is It is a bold it's... choice. Yeah. Well. And yeah. Um, for those of us who are sitting on pins and needles just waiting for Carlos Sainz to announce something, oh, yeah. um, we got nothing at all. So no, stay squat. tuned for, you know, another round of tinfoil hat contract talks in every single episode until... Carlos says anything one of the campers here came up to me and was like has Carlos announced his team yet and I'm like no no he has not and she she says to me like I thought he was supposed to it's his home race I'm like that's what we all thought was gonna happen wouldn't it have been nice but no he didn't I also just would like to give the Webster Dictionary explicit definition of soon to all of these drivers Mm -hmm. because they're like oh it'll come soon like Checo for his you know he's like I want to know my game plan for next year soon I'll make you know things are coming out soon we'll have news soon and it was like two months that's not soon I'm sorry that's that's a completely different time 
Yeah, um, soon versus a couple of months are two wildly different periods. Soon is like next race. And we didn't yeah. have a two-month gap, so. Yeah, exactly. Looking at you, Checo. And you, Carlos. Yeah, mostly I mean, Carlos these days. I was going to make a joke, but how refrain. Um, <laughs> now I'm just laughing at it in my head. This is how right. Emily works. Um, but yeah, but we did have a good race. Sands, signs, announcement. Um, Max Verstappen won his 61st race uh, since the his first win in Spain in 2020. Uh, 16 which is incredible I think they were giving a stat of like from his first Grand Prix to now I think he's won like 66% of his races or something like that that's not probably accurate but I just remember 66 being the percentage which is wild yeah no I think two years something like that so he is 66 percent he's won a lot it's it's absurd and I the race that he won in in 2016 it was one of my highlights from that season which I have watched every race of the 2016 season if you're watching on YouTube it's linked above um but it's it's just it's wild that like you know 2016 to now is eight years and there's 20 races in a season like the the amount of races he has won lately is just it's wild almost as wild as saying 2016 is eight years ago (laughs) it is oh time is so weird it is it's on like i'm i'm in the camp and a firm believer of 2000 was like hop skip and a jump ago not long ago it was 24 years ago but it no, we had we we have kids here who ha- weren't born until 2014. I know it's weird. Yeah, like, you can legally drink now, and you were born in the 2000s, and like you weren't born when 9/11 happened. Like that's insane mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, it's wild, wild. Um, but anyway, going off track a little bit. Sorry, I I have a little bit of a bone to pick with the Sky Sport sports oh. broadcast, and you know that I do because I complain about I it all morning this morning. I know you do, and I know that this was one of your least favorite races to listen to. <laughs> well, I mean, I did stop listening to it at a point when I was getting ready for the for the day, and you know, was you know chatting with the bathroom with my room in the bathroom with my roommates. But like, I think a lot of it was you know, they were trying to make fetch happen because obviously Lando's car was gaining on Max's significantly, but I still think that there was a lot of like, oh, Max is in danger. Max is struggling. And just because Max isn't winning by 25 seconds, I don't think that means that he's struggling. Like if you look at, because I, after the race, I was feeling petty. So I looked at his margins of victory since Imola and in Imola, he only beat Lando by seven and a quarter tenths. Whereas in Canada, he won by almost four seconds. And in this race, it was about 2.2. But we still, going to the end of the race, there was never a point where it really felt like Lando was closing on Max. Like, Max didn't have to defend at all from from Lando, you know, at the end. Could it have gotten there within an extra couple of laps and Max would have really had to work for the win? Absolutely. But he didn't. Well, and see, I think we just interpreted it differently, and maybe it's because I, I don't know if you had subtitles, if you were actually listening to the audio, but to me, it came across like they were hearing team radio calls that we weren't, and they were like, oh, Max is saying he's struggling. Like, that's how I interpreted it. And so, like, I gave them a little bit of a pass there. I know they were saying other things like, oh, Lando can, Lando can make it. And I'm like, can he, he can make up five seconds in like five laps he did make up time yes and it did look yeah. like max was slowing down but i wouldn't say he's like struggling on like three wheels to cross you know and get the checkered flag but well, i yeah. definitely interpreted it as like they were because we, on the broadcast we don't get full radio we only get certain ones that come through and but obviously the commentators and the presenters hear more than we do and so I, that's how I took it was like, they're hearing more from team radio than we are. That's just like not making the broadcast. That's true. But then when it comes to like actual facts, like when they're saying, oh, Lando is closing in on Max and this is a Max who is pulling away from George, who at the time was in the P2 position. And I'm like, so how is Lando getting closer to Max if George is getting further away from Max? How does that work? Well, I can't okay I can't sit here and defend them to the death on that one I'm, I and I'm, I'm not asking you to but I'm just no, saying that no, like no. there there has I, to be a little bit of understanding of reality and not just trying to make this dramatic for the sake of making dramatic tv because Max does keep winning 
Right, but we know we know how F one works, and we know yep. that they like the drama and they want the competition. Um, I do think we're getting much more competitive races. Like if, like you were saying, percent previous gaps. Like, I mean, what beginning of the season, Max won by like what twenty four, twelve seconds, something insane, mm-hmm. and then there were huge gaps in between everybody else. Now we're getting much smaller gaps between everybody, so it is much more competitive racing, and I think there is still drama there. I mean, oh, absolutely. It wasn't it wasn't flat out clear that Max was going to win until much much later in the race, and normally it's by like the tenth turn of the first lap. So yeah, it was it was exciting. I lo- I love this excitement. I live for it. It stresses me out. Yeah, but it's great. Um, but I I don't think we like there was. A, I thought I felt that there was a lot more implied that he was struggling. Whereas in Imola, you knew how badly he was struggling toward the end of the race in Imola, and right. you know yes, what he wasn't fair. he wasn't cruising, but he wasn't in danger to you know to the point where you know Red Bull fans would need to be worried. Um, so that's no, that's 100%. all I'm saying there. Um, and of course, you and I both know you know my opinions on the broadcasters who were on the you know who were on this weekend and so happy to have. Bernie Collins's insights. Oh, I know. I love. I mean, it's so fascinating to hear anyone talk about F one who's been around for as long as you know Crofty or um, Martin Brundle. But to have like an actual ex strategist like Bernie come on and be like, "Oh, well, no, actually, you would do this and this and this and this, and oh, you do this because of this." It it gives you so much more insight, and I wish they would have her on for more races. But we do have more oh, races for, with her this season than last season, which is nice. So. I just they they need to keep upping how many races they have her on and maybe lowering yeah. some some other people's. But I I love her insights and it's you know it's one thing to be you know an ex racer as a lot of these commentators are just ex Formula One drivers. But it's another thing to like have somebody who's like giving the drivers the strategies and how you know it goes how, what goes into that and you know how she can basically do this math off the top of her head to figure out what like the qualifying time to you know get through to the next qualifying session is is going to be. So I thought. It, you know her her insights are as always fascinating we do need to read her book at some point so we can react to it yes um speaking of insights i thought some of the graphics this weekend were really interesting especially like the lewis one so they did like a comparison of him going on hards versus him going on um mediums or softs at the very end i can't remember what he finished on but they showed like mediums. oh he, this is mediums yeah so it's like oh this is what he's at but if he would have gone here this is the differential and the delta and like this is where he would be placed like if you did the other choice so i think it's really interesting how detailed some of these graphics are getting for these races oh i love it i'm i'm here for all of the technical graphics like they're they're fantastic yeah, i really really appreciate the, the technical well, no, I graphics. think they're they're adding more more and more as time goes, and yeah, I mean they also had like George on the hard, so they had his his data, um, and then also yeah. Lewis's. But yeah, I I also really think that they got George's strategy very very wrong because George should not have had as bad of a race that he did. I know that he's not your favorite, um, but definitely he he got a little screwed. Yeah, but I mean he also could have just driven better, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he had a great he had a great start off the line, sweeping had, past his teammate and two other drivers to take P one for you know all of a minute, a, a lap. I think he had maybe the most perfect start he could have hoped for, and I was just waiting for the radio call to come through, of him just like telling his team and bossing them around and bullying them into being like, "No, we have to do this. What are we doing?" Blah 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 blah. But. I don't know. No, and instead we we had um the the you know Charles doing that with Ferrari of why are we on Plan A? Well, because <gasps> everyone's on Plan A, Charles. Um, but but not yeah. so casually, more of the yelly the yelly Leclerc. Why are we on Plan A? <laughs> Yeah, but to to talk about Lewis and, and his podium today, and then we'll talk about Lando. He broke his own Formula One record for most podiums, and he now has 198. But also, he has been on a Formula One podium, and this is absurd to me. In each of the last 18 years, like that's there are, I think, counselors on our staff who are younger than that, who have who have never lived in a world where Lewis Hamilton hasn't been on a podium in Formula One. Yeah, and I mean, I know we all make the joke of, like, how old Alonzo is, but Lewis isn't far behind him, Yeah, and Lewis, I mean, Alonzo's, ama- he's a world champion, he's amazing, but he hasn't always consistently been on amazing teams to always wind up right. on the podium, so for Lewis and his, the longevity of his career, 
for 18 years he has landed on a podium like that's impressive i know you're not a huge fan of him and i'm gonna i understand what he represents to to the sport right when we've talked about this too like with his racing and also his off track um i don't know presence let's say yeah um he's so so great for formula one and i think it's good that he is continuing to perform well so that he can continue his efforts off track as well so exactly his his advocacy is you know second to maybe sebastian vettel and you know and they're completely different different animals um but yeah no it it is did i love seeing him on the podium not necessarily but at least he wasn't on the top step I, i could live with him not being at the top step um of on the podium um but speaking of p2 lando norris's day went pretty well and he was very disappointed for a race that he drove exceedingly well in and obviously was expecting to win i don't know if expecting to win but i think he just there were a few things where he was like noticeably he regretted and it was like if you know these few things went a little bit differently i would have been on the top and i think now that he's won in miami He's really hungry for that second win. And and mm-hmm. we've talked about this too. Like, I think he's going to get a second win this season. He's driving really, really well. And the car keeps improving. I think McLaren's doing a really, really good job um, kind of maintaining them at the top. And I think it's because he was so close. It's not like he started on pole. He didn't have a great start. And that, I think, was just – he because he was even saying, if I had a better start – you know, I would have won. And I, and I don't yeah. think he's wrong. Yeah. The the one interesting thing I, I had seen and not from him and not from like team personnel, but a lot of people fan wise have been saying that Lando should have won. And I think the answer is no, not it. it it's not should it is could he absolutely could have won um, right. the 3.6 second pit stop because one did of his tires help. got stuck on lap 48 did not help him at all really screwed him up. He got lucky that he managed to come out of the pits ahead of George. Um, but like that that didn't help Max did get an advantage because he did manage an overtake on that first stint, or maybe it was the second stint. I don't remember it, it all kind of blurred together after a while. Um, but it, it really it, it you, you have to with the way Max is driving that Red Bull you have to have the perfect day in order to beat him um or else you have to wait for Max to beat himself whether it's qualifying badly in somewhere you can't overtake you know driving over a bollard and you know destroying the bottom of your uh, of your car or having a mechanical failure like that's that's what it takes right now for to beat Max Verstappen is for Max to beat himself um I don't know and, if that's necessarily but, true though like I think you just have to be a fraction better than him well you don't yeah but perfect but what I'm what I what I'm thinking is that like we're at that point right now where it, it really is you do have to be as good as possible and there were a, just enough things that didn't go Lando's way with McLaren that you know hampered him from this win and we could very easily see Lando getting another win I agree with you and I think we could even see it before the summer break yeah I think these next few are going to, I mean, Austria is so different. It's so fast. It's so short. Yeah. Um, That one's going to be an interesting one, I think. I think we might get a, another kind of, you know, mixed grid a little bit. Um, But I think this was a really, really good race for Lando for him to, like, get a little bit, a taste of it. Be like, okay, I can be there with Max. I can top Max. I was this close. Like, I know I have to fix X, Y, and Z, and then I'm there. It's yeah, not, and they you know, know what exactly I mean. what they need to, right. to to fix. Also, yeah. let's talk about the fact that, you know, beyond it being a thousand days in between pole positions, he is McLaren's only pole sitter in the last decade. Yeah, because uh, Hamilton wasn't there or in the last decade, I guess. It's been that long. Yeah, it's that been old. that long. You know, Danny <laughs> didn't have any any pole positions because Lando's, of course, was in that Russia race in 2021 right. where had they, you know, not made the decision they made with the tires, then he he would have won that race. Um, but th- this is also the second time he has converted pole to heartbreak. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that was also part of why he was very disheartened at the end of the race and like, you know, I had pole. I could have won. This was better than Russia. And I didn't, you know, make it to the finish line ahead. Yeah. But all in all, he did have a good race. And I think given the circumstances from the first corner, he carried it out. Like he could have just faded and been defeated and he didn't. He he fought it out and he got P2 and he drove a really good race. 
Yeah, no, that, and I mean, honestly, that McLaren is way too good to be stuck behind a Mercedes right now. And even with the improvements that Mercedes has made, the McLaren is just, or at least Lando's McLaren is so much better. We'll talk about Oscar in a minute. I didn't think it was a great weekend for Oscar. No, I mean, we can, we can jump into Oscar a little bit, but like, I just, it was very meh. Like, it's Mm -hmm. not like he, he disappointed or I I thought he had a bad weekend. I just... Lando's doing so good that Oscar is performing well, but not as good as Lando. And it's not like he's, you know, not making it into Q3 and not getting in the points. Right. He's just right. not on the podium. And it's only his second season. Like, we, I think we forget about that so much. He's only in his second season and he's still doing really well. I mean, if we're going to sit and nitpick, like, look at Checo, right? Because they're in the same car. Max is on the right. podium, Checo is, is down or not making it into Q3. So I, I mean, I think <laughs> if Checo's Well, he did bar... make it into Q3 this week. <laughs> right. Okay. This week he did. But looking yeah. back to previous weeks, like Oscar's always up there. So I don't think we right. can be too disappointed in him. Well, yeah, yeah, no, it just, it, 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 it really felt like there were a, there are a lot of miles in between Lando and Oscar this weekend. And yeah, and the same thing with like Max and Perez, you know, and Perez did finally finish in the points for the first time since Imola, but as we expect, he should be better. And I think that they, he, he got really lucky that that three stop was decent um, because it could have, it could have been worse for him. So the fact that he has finally put some points on the board, even if it was P8 points. Uh, Red Bull will take it and hope figure out which new therapist to call to hopefully get his head back on straight. Right. Well, and I think, I mean, speaking of those two, and I think it's an interesting comparison. I, I don't think it's fair for everyone to group, like, for Paris to be where he's at versus Max, I don't think it's acceptable. But I think Oscar, I give him a little bit more leeway. Like, you know what I mean? He, cause he's... Yeah, and I mean, it It didn't help that he didn't, you know, record a time in qualifying, right. um, yeah. which also you should record a time in qualifying and if you make it into Q3. So that didn't help him. And then there was just so much else going on ahead of him on the grid that he really just kind of, you know, hung out where he was the entire race. Um, but yeah, I mean, not to say that it was a bad weekend, but I feel like based on the whole overall performance of the McLaren, I would have liked to see Oscar a little bit higher. Yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, so much happening on the grid ahead of Oscar. Um, so the Ferraris are fighting again. <laughs> yep, they're still fighting. <laughs> still fighting. Not again. They're still fighting. Um, and I, like, in the back of my mind, I don't want to say, like, I predicted this, but in the back of my mind, I kind of anticipated that we would have to talk about this a lot this season just because Carlos is leaving. He's right. driving for a seat. Charles is their golden boy. And I just, I know that it's just not, I think it's just going to go downhill from here. I really think we're going to get more of them fighting, more of them not following team orders. And it just, this is the beginning of the end of their season. Mark my words. Yeah, and I, I sent you the some of the quotes from the 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 media pen from from Charles and 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 Carlos and Charles was like I know it was his home race and he was expecting to do something different but you know I'm still a Ferrari driver and whatever and then Carlos is like I was faster um, so it, it's you know very much they're they're not communicating at the moment and I don't think they want to um, and you know not to say that there's going to be continued drama but these guys need to stop qualifying near each other so that they're not fighting each other on the track because it won't end well yeah I don't know I just I when you have a situation like they have where they drop someone seemingly out of nowhere and mm-hmm. then they're you know I know that Charles won Monaco, but Carlos has been doing really, really well this season. And when you have that going on, it's it's not going to be good. They couldn't have no. thought this would be a good situation. I mean, I put it on Ferrari as a team that they announced Lewis so early. Like, they could have avoided all of this. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, would it be would it be easy to, to you know, keep that a, a secret? Probably not. But at the same time, like they, it, he didn't have they 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 didn't have to announce in February, especially since like it started breaking, and then they still waited like 
14 hours to actually make the official announcement. And like, there was a whole like TV retrospective about the the move before the move was actually officially announced on sky. Um, So so it's, it's, it's really dumb. The Ferraris, like they need to get their heads together. Um, And we, we need this to not be like the, you know, the Alpines when the Alpines were fighting, you know, for example, in Monaco, Um, but the Alpines actually had a great weekend, which is weird. Again, I think great comparative is very vague. And comparative. It's a low bar. <laughs> the bar is low. The bar is the bar is in the toilet. The bar is downstairs. But there comparatively, is no bar. <laughs> um, yeah, from starting at the beginning of the season and us making jokes that they wouldn't get any points, and now they've had two races back to back and double points. You know, I think things are looking up for them. Again, slowly. I don't know where Gasly ever ends up. I could care less about him. Um, and it's not just because he's Alpine. It was when he was on AlphaTauri, too. RIP yeah. to that team. Uh, mm-hmm. Speaking of that team, um, Red Bull JV squad stunk it up this weekend. Oh, my God. They looked terrible. Yeah. They looked terrible. And they had brought upgrades, too, which makes it even worse um, when, when your upgrades but look like that. But we all know and how like... upgrades happen. Like, it's either an upgrade or a downgrade. And I don't know. It's you, serious. You never really know until you're until you're in a a race. This was horrible. Like they were yeah. god awful. Yeah. Not only that, but surprise! It was Danny Ricardo's two hundred and fiftieth career race, which, like, I I never realized just how long he's been in Formula One. Um, but this is. This is not the milestone to to make memory of, even though he did finish pretty far ahead of Yuki, who just had a terrible day and was just, like, not featured at all because he didn't do anything. Well, I, they qualified terribly. And Yuki's, yeah, they qualified, they like, were, like... They told Yuki eight, that he didn't make it through to Q2. And he's like, you're kidding me, how? Yeah. Um, but they, they were just bad all weekend long, all across the board. Yeah, it was it was completely, you know, a complete reversal of what, you know, we saw from them in Canada. And, you know, yeah. let's let's not have that happen again in Austria. Um, so, yeah, crossing fingers. Yeah. But on a brighter note, F1 Academy was back this weekend. Yes. And it was really exciting. Lots going on. A ton of action. So, Catherine, you want to – I'll kick to you for the, for the Academy update. You were more in tune with it than I was this weekend because – I'm yes. on vacation. <laughs> You're on vacation, and I had a little bit more time to to watch the races in my downtime. You know, running a summer camp. Um, totally fair. You were you were busy. You know, having chilies in Chile, which is totally something that you know one must accomplish in their life. Um, I'm not even kidding when I say it's on my bucket list. It was on my bucket oh, list for sure to eat at Chili's in Chile. <laughs> yeah, which I did. So. <laughs> So we've been talking a lot lately about Abby Pulling. She's the Alpine driver on the grid. Um, She had won four straight races before American Haas driver Chloe Chambers broke her four-race win streak to win race two, um, which is really cool, especially when you think, like, you don't think of Haas as necessarily a race-winning team. Um, But she has the Haas organization's only win in single-seater, I think. It, I think it could be that. I think that's pretty fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. And they, it, she had a massive points haul. So the, the race one podium was Abby Pulling, who she just went off the line and disappeared. Um, Nerea Marti, who is from Spain. It was her home race. She's the Tommy Hilfiger driver and her car and race suit are just the coolest. Love. Um, and apparently bet- between the last race in Miami and this race in uh, in Barcelona, she got married. Oh, good for her. Love that. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, and then yeah, and then Chloe's Chambers, she finished third. She actually qualified second um, in both races, and um, she lost position and was able to. Um, she lost a couple positions, I think, but then ga- gained back. Um, and then race two, she just beat Abby pulling straight off the line from P2 and just disappeared off into the sunset. And one point she was up by like seven seconds. Abby pulling managed to finish P2 and just kind of stayed P2 the entire race, trying to hunt Chambers down and just couldn't. Um, and then um, Hamda al who's one of the al sisters on the grid, um, she's the Red Bull racing driver, which is different from the Red Bull Academy driver or the V-Carb driver, who are all driving for the same team. Um, 
she finished in third, which was um, her team's, like the actual constructor, um, MP Motorsports best finish so far. And there has been like a ton of distance put between Abby pulling um, at the top of the driver's standings oh, yeah. and everyone behind. Yeah, she, it's like a- almost absurd how many points you can come away with in a, a Formula One Academy weekend, especially when you have, you know, two races. But she has 147 points. So she's ahead of Dorian Pond, who is still recovering from broken ribs which it turned out the broken ribs were not actually from racing at Spa with Formula Regional Europe, but actually from a biking accident that same weekend. Um, so basically drivers need to stay off bikes because- I was going to uh, say, Lance what Stroll, are we doing on bikes, guys? Stay yeah, off the bikes. So, so Pawn is um, in P2. She's got 81 points. Chloe Chambers shot up from P4 to P3, um, though she's tied on points with Pawn, but by like aggregate finish, she's um, she's in that third position. Nerea Marti um, also moved up from P6 to P4. She's got 63 points. And then Bianca Bustamante from McLaren, um, who had a pretty anonymous weekend. It, was, it wasn't really a great weekend for her in Spain. She's got 57 points. Nice. And then, uh, so for constructors, so it's a little different, I mean, a little different, because, like, in F1 Academy, it's a stock car, so it's not like all these different constructors are constructing these cars, like, we have an F1, but they're Mm -hmm. teams, so where are we at in the team standings? So there was a lot of movement in the team standings over the weekend, um, Prima Racing, which um, they had led the standings the first couple of weekends, they're actually down to P3. Um, Roden Motorsport, who had been P2, is now in P1. They've got 176 points. Compost Racing went from P3 to P2 um, with the biggest gainer of the weekend with 71 points from the three drivers on the team. Um, Prima Racing only gained about 24 points um, in P3. And then MP Motorsport moved up from p5 to p4 they've got 76 and then art is is down in the bottom mp motorsport and art grand prix flip-flopped um and they're only three points apart so there there's still so many opportunities for points there's plenty of opportunity for art grand prix to you know get a significant points haul next time we see them and the next time we will see the academy is not going to be it for a while um because they're not back until the first race after the f1 summer break in august at zanport and the dutch grand prix Oh, I love Zanvoort. It's one of my so favorites. So excited for Zanvoort yeah. in the future. We have we have races to get to first. In the future. And speaking of races, we have to go through our Spanish Grand Prix predictions, which yes. we just murdered in a bad way. <laughs> um, so for our pole position, we both had Max and obviously Lando got it, even though I'm thinking Max did this on purpose in getting P2 because P2, you definitely have a better line to the first corner in Spain. So I feel like this was strategic. I think it could have been. I I, I was saying to to someone else here that, you know, Max was sandbagging through the practice, like the, those later practice sessions. Um, and, you know, yes, you know, Max got very lucky with the toe that he got at qualifying to put him, you know, two hundredths of a second behind Lando and Lando was very, very fast in that McLaren. Um, yeah. But I think it also could have been strategy, you know, some, sometimes some grid positions, you know, depending on the tracks and like what side is the clean side and which side is, is the dirty side, you know, racing line, non-racing line. Sometimes it's better not to start P1. Yeah. Sometimes it's not that you'd ever admit that. No, but sometimes like based on the corner and like you said, the clean side, dirty side, it's better to be an even or an odd. So if it's better to be an even, you don't want that pole position. Right. Exactly. Because they stack. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. And then going on to our podium, like we talked before, it was Max Lando Lewis. I was so close. I got half or two thirds of it. Um, You had Max George Charles. I had Max Lando Carlos. Um, And, you know, Ferrari didn't have a great weekend. So we both missed out on that. For P10, it was Akon. And I picked Akon. And I was very, very worried about picking Akon. But now I'm glad I did. So, yeah. Yay. And you picked Danny and you jinxed him. And I jinxed him again. Again. Yep. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm just going to stop picking Danny. You know, I think P10 is like where it's at for me. 
Um, and that's how I'm, I'm coming back because as of right now, you have 19 points and you had one weekend where you got everything right and I got everything wrong. So that was yeah. like our big swing, but I'm coming back with my P10 fix because I think I've gotten a few of them. So I, you have 19 points. I have 13. We still have a lot of season left to go. Um, but so far. We shall see. We, we shall see. Um, beyond your perfect weekend, we haven't been too good on our, <laughs> on our picks. Nope. So we'll nope. get there eventually. Um, and then going into our, you know, our, our dumb and surprise of the weekend, you said that Haas was going to have a good weekend. Um, no. Again, good is subjective. Um, they didn't Hulk DNF. was okay, but, <laughs> Hulk was but, okay, also, but yeah. I'm, I'm not going to give myself that even though Hulk <laughs> was just one position out of the points, like. K Mags was over back and they were so anonymous. Like, no. Yeah. Um, and then I said that Logan is going to finish the race and have a solid race. So he did finish. He did. He did a DNF. So half credit to me, but he did not have a solid race. Was not solid all weekend. Um, no. Can can we talk about the fact that he qualified P20, <laughs> got a three-place penalty for impeding, and then started P19? <laughs> <laughs> and then finish P20. Yeah, I don't think it, it was his best week. No, no, so it's, it's, it's in, rough. He started in P19 because Albon changed his power unit, so he had a pit lane start. So if you're wondering how that happened, that's how that happened. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, that negates my half right of him finishing a race, so I didn't. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm always bordering of being a cheerleader and putting my shit on Logan hat, so... Maybe yeah. next week I don't have so much faith in him. But going into who's going to do a dumb, um, you said McLaren was due for a dumb, and I don't think – I think Not they had yet. a pretty good weekend. Um, I said Ferrari, and I'd say yes. Like, they were fighting. They were confused on strategy. They're still fighting. Um, I'd, I'd say that one checks out. So Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you. They were just not it. No, I don't think so. And they were bringing upgrades and, you know, just, I don't know, I, they need to get their house in order. Mm -hmm. um, but final thoughts, I really enjoyed it. There were some, there were some really good overtakes. I think the, the start of the race um, with George proved it, you know, very interesting to, or provided entertainment and made it interesting to watch. Um, it was also a clean race. So there were no yeah. yellow flags. There were no DNFs. I mean, I know that changes strategy and that like makes it exciting, but it's also nice to see, you know, good clean racing as well. So I thought it was yeah. good race. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was definitely a good solid race. It was, you know, exciting at the front, which is what we always like to see and what we, you know, haven't really seen for a while when you consider Max's dominance in 2023. Um, but yeah, I, I liked what I saw. I love that Max has like some really solid competition and that, you know, we're going to be able to really see him battle and fight for you know wins and we're also going to see other drivers fight for these I wins say, and I spoken like a true red bull fan I obviously finally has competition and max will fight people <laughs> yes i mean he's, across the board <laughs> he he will fight both literally and in his car um and you know always love to see good things for lando um and it's it's really exciting to see you know from a constructor standpoint a customer team you know showing what's what to their their suppliers and you know even you know even though mercedes did have a good weekend then you know they they had they had a good weekend but they still screw, screwed george over with uh, his strategy if i had to pick any clip we've ever had of you on a podcast that describes <laughs> you it would be this one that just happened this recap yep. well you know max finally has some competition but you know he's still the best and i hate mercedes <laughs> yep <laughs> pretty much Catherine. Kevin, in a recap. Uh, well, this is the end of the episode, which brings us to your F1 fun fact. So what is your F1 fun fact for us today, Catherine? So our F1 fun fact is um, in the 1970s, Tyrell, who was a former Formula One team, they produced a six-wheeled car. And the six-wheeled car, yeah, it had six <laughs> wheels. And not only that, but in 76, it won the Swedish Grand Prix and throughout, it, you know, two seasons gained 14 podiums. So like it was not a slouch of a car, even though it was like two big rear tires and then like on each side, two smaller front tires. And this was like legal? Yeah. Well, render me speechless. I'm 
I'm so intrigued. I have to go find this car. That's so I will, weird. I will, I will send it to you later. Um, yeah. But it's, it's fascinating, like, what they kind of allowed in the, like, wild west of motorsport before the actual like real actual rules came into play and like you well, would Catherine, never get we a... have a rule book why aren't we following it? we have a rule book <laughs> and this is a reference to to carlos signs in one of his battles with hamilton today and he was very upset about um you know lewis not getting penalized for the, their fight which but i agree i also agree it was it was dumb and, and he wouldn't shut up about it and they're like just drive <laughs> drive the car forget about it no but just yeah drive. yeah yeah um, formula 1 uses the rule book until it like in, in until it stops suiting them to use the rule book look at um Kimi Antonelli and the um the super license the Max Verstappen rule which also may or may not be for Kimi Antonelli and may actually play into Red Bull's junior team's plans for for something so that's interesting. And then I also um, talked, where did I talk? There was something else that I talked about that was rules related. Oh, the minimum, the maximum lap time nonsense. Oh, I always yeah. talk about the maximum, you know, are, how are you going to penalize the maximum lap, lap time, um, you know, violation when you set a really bad precedence at Monza last year? Yeah. Well, and like to, to bring this full circle, Carlos like got a pissy about the Lewis thing. He's like, we have a rule book for a reason. Why aren't we using it? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, buddy, your team has definitely benefited from things. So let's just yeah. push pause there. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a good fun fact. I want to see what Thanks. this car looks like now. Um, and looking forward. Yes. Big news. Emily's going on hiatus slash vacation. <laughs> so as all of you hopefully know by now, if you don't, welcome to the podcast. Um, I live in South America. I have lived in South America for two and a half years. I'm leaving South America this week or this coming week. So, well, kind of. I'm doing my last hurrah um, over the 4th of July holiday, and then I'm moving home to the U.S. So because I have so much going on and I'm trying to shut my life down in the continent, um, I will be going on hiatus for the next two races. So we do have a tri uh, triple header and which is spain um silverstone well spain austria, and austria then silverstone. silverstone so i will be out for austria and silverstone um we will have some fun surprise guests uh hosts for you um but i will be out just you know taking in all of the winter in south america before i come home to the heat wave that no one will stop telling me about so yeah. yep it's it's warm here and i'm by a beach and it's warm here <laughs> yes but we will not stop the podcast just while I'm out. Um, and so next week we will have our Austria predictions sometime that fits in Catherine's busy, busy schedule running a summer yeah, camp. Yeah, I, I am going to be hiking in the wilderness and sleeping on, on ground outside this week. So I will record the podcast at some point and it should be out ahead of at the your, race weekend. Sure. At at yeah. some point on thursday it might be out thursday afternoon it might be out friday morning we shall see but that's kind of where i'm ballparking it based on what's going on here it's one of those weeks welcome to our tbd season of going off track <laughs> exactly uh well that has been our spanish grand prix recap episode thanks for going off track with us guys